Dinner time, innit? To have a copy of God's Word, extract that is from the Bible, the uh, Holy and Divine Scriptures, the Word of God, uh, breathed out every word of it uh, from the living and true God, the Creator, Preserver, and the Governor of the universe in which you live and of course the one who would be your faith in his son Jesus Christ your Redeemer what of God is offered to you not the writings of men not the writings of uh, you know like Shakespeare or Daft Dawkins or something like that, but God's Word. Powerful and of course, with the ability uh, to back it up. All that's promised, all that's commanded, and all of course, I have to say that threatened the Word of God, offered to you yours for the taking, written Word of God, Read for yourself and see that uh, what God has uh, written and spoken that order that you might repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and know salvation in his name. Like a copy of God's word, I'm going to ask for one. Gladly place one into your hand. What of God tells us, of course, the problem is that uh, we all of us, you know, we all of us because of our first daddy. Adam, his name was, first man, you know, he was the uh, federal head, he was the, uh, he was the uh, head of the human race, you know, uh, the one who uh, God, first made, you know, and then, uh, well, he sinned, you know, he, he got it wrong, he blew it, he, uh, he sinned, he went against God, he rebelled against God, and he brought, you know, the sin into the world, uh, death, you know, and all the, uh, all the bad stuff, you know, that uh, we find in our world today, uh, that these guys have to chase after, you know, uh, in their uh, daily labors, arresting and locking people up for doing wrong. Well, where's the wrong come from? The wrong comes in the hearts of men and women. Because Adam sinned, you see, and we've all of us down through the generations, one after the other, and we'll do right to the end, you know. We're conceived, you know. We're conceived at the moment of conception, uh, you know, where, where your mother was, you know, your mother conceived you in her womb, that's where your life began, and that's where your sin career began. Nine months, nine months later, you were born in sin, and you remain in sin, in a state of sin and death, until that is, of course, God regenerates you, puts new life into you, causes you to be, well, as Jesus puts it, born again and you're given to repent and believe the gospel and know the life of God, the love of God, and to know the salvation of God. But it goes back to Adam, you see. All the way back, you can trace it all the way back. That's where, that's where it comes from. That's where, it, that's where it began, where it started. And so the question is here today for you, and all men then, you know, as they perished in Adam, are they all saved? I mean, everybody, everybody died in Adam. 
Everybody's sending at them, you know. Even if you could, you know, you could confess, you know, honestly and truly, you never ever did anything wrong, never broke, never broke one of God's commandments. I mean, you can, but if you could, just for argument's sake, well, you would still be separated from God. You would still be a sinner uh, by nature, you see. It's very nature, and, well, you know, maybe sometimes you do ask yourself in a quieter, a more sensible moment, you know, a reflective, you know, contemplative mind, you know, and you might think to yourself, well, why do I do things wrong? You know, why do I keep doing things wrong? I know it's wrong, I know I shouldn't do it, I know, you know, but I still do it. Why, why do I do it? Why do I keep on doing it? Why don't I stop it? Why can't I stop it? You know? See, it's the nature, it's not just what you do, it's not just what you think, all that's bad enough, you know? Because your nature, your very nature, the sinner by nature. So when you're asked the question, what are you? The question is not, the answer is not, I'm a good person. The answer is not, I'm okay. The answer is, I am sin. I am sin. That's what you are. I am sin. From the top of your head to the tip of your toes, inside and outside, all the way through, right to your back teeth, that's what you are. Nothing but sin. It's because of Adam, you see. Because your first parents and mine, you know, because of the first man, the head of the human race, he brought the sin into the world so that God can say all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everybody, every single person brought into this world, except the one, of course, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You see, he didn't have an healthy parent. The sin nature, don't you know? It's passed on through the lines of the male. Yes, yeah, your daddy. It's your daddy that gives you your sin nature. That's why Jesus, that's why he could not have an earthly father. You see, he was conceived of the Holy Ghost in the virgin's womb. No earthly father, and so no sin nature like you and I. The only man born into this world who did not have a sinful nature, who it was and is, still is, without sin. But for the rest of us, all apart from Jesus Christ, the Son of God, all of us are sinners in Adam. We've all sinned. All come short of the glory of God. None righteous, no, not one, not a single one. But then, of course, you might ask the question, and it's a legitimate one. Well, if, we, if everybody perished in Adam, and of course, you know, well, I do have to say, you know, that, you know, the sin, you know, it, it's bad, you know, it gives us a bad day, it gives us a bad life. You know, it destroys people in this world. Some of you in the city of Nottingham already, you know, destroyed in mind. Mind bent and twisted, not thinking right. Well, because of sin, you know, because of your own personal involvement in sin. And then, of course, some of you, many of you, broken in body because of your personal involvement in sin. Sin is destructive, so, so destructive. But of course, you know, maybe perhaps you would take some comfort if you could say, well, you know what, I'm dead, I'm dead, that's it's all over. No, no, that, that's not the case, you see. And the consequences go much, much, much further than that, you see. Right out into eternity. When you die, you meet with God, the judge. That's why I say, you know, as you're passing by, and I offer you a piece of literature, you know, I say, you know, we all need a savior because the judge is at the door. And you just don't know when. I look around here in the city today, in Nottingham, and I see a lot of gray-haired people just like me, you know, and you've not got long to go. You've spent your three score years and ten, and who knows, like a friend of mine, just a week past Saturday night, I just plain dropped down dead in his house, heart attack. Just, well, almost 80, but he was gone just in a nanosecond. And just the same way, 
Well, who knows, but you can go. And, you know, you don't have to be 80 because death is no respecter of age. No respecter of the rich, the poor, no respecter of anyone. Death, the grim reaper, you might be a king, you might just be a street preacher, but everybody faces the grim reaper. He comes for us all, eventually, and he's coming for you too. I don't know when, neither do you, but you have to be ready because the judge, as I say, is standing at the door. And your sin, you see, will take you out of the world into the presence of God to be judged for your sin. Yeah, Adam, he brought the sin, but we're all accountable, all responsible, but because Adam sinned, because Adam apostatized, because Adam rebelled against God, and because you have in your sinful nature, God in his great kindness and mercy has provided us with the Savior. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son into the world that through him, that whosoever believeth on him, on Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only God of the Father, full of grace and truth, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. God has provided an escape route. God has provided a way out of the mess of sin. God has prepared a remedy, a way by which you can be restored to God's favor, by which, of course, well, you can be safe both for time and for eternity. It's that gospel, it's that good news that I bring to you here today once again in the city of Nottingham, that someone, someone, even one, might hear, might turn, might believe, might be saved, might be reconciled to God. Oh, I implore you, be reconciled to God. There is a way by which a man can be repaired, by which a man can come to know eternal and everlasting life. But you might ask the question, and it would be a good one. Well, if everybody, everybody, the world over, every day, every generation, if they all perished, all sinned in Adam, well, does that mean that everybody, everybody head for head, will all be saved by Jesus Christ? The second or the last Adam? Well, the short answer to that question is no. No, definitely not. Not everybody will be saved. Only those, that is, who believe in Jesus Christ. Only those, that is, God has ordained to eternal life. Those whom God, oh, God has chosen. Because you see, it's not you that do the choosing, it's God who does it. So you see, the answer are all men then, as they perished in Adam, are they all saved by Christ? And well, the answer is no. Only those who are engrafted into him, into Christ, and receive all his benefits by a true faith. Well, that raises other questions too. What does it mean to be engrafted into Christ? Well, it means to be, well, to be born again and to be united to Jesus Christ by faith. That is by a true faith. Not just the profession. There's a lot of people who profess, confess a lot of things, you know. As you know as well as I do, you know, you got a world full of religion. And some, of course, they, well, they pay some kind of lip service, you know, to Jesus Christ. You know, Islam, Roman Catholicism, the Watchtower Society. Well, just about the whole nine yards. They've all got something to say about Jesus Christ. But of course, they're not always right. And of course, well, truth be known, none of them are right. They're all just damnable religion. They're all apostate. They're all man-made. You know, the imaginations, the deceitful and wicked imaginations of men. There's no salvation outside of Jesus Christ. 
the only appointed and anointed and sent Saviour, sent into the world to be the Saviour of the world. Jesus Christ, as he is revealed in the Word of God in the Bible. No salvation outside of him. Not Muhammad, not the Pope, not Confucius, not Buddha, not Charles D. Russell, not Nellan G. White, not any of these worldwide cults. No salvation in any of them. Jesus Christ alone is the only Savior. I am, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, that is, no one gets right with the Father, no one gets right with God but by me, by Jesus, Jesus Christ, that is. So you have to be united and grafted into Jesus Christ, you see, and receive, of course, all the benefits, all the benefits, of course, that Jesus, that God affords a man or woman in his son, Jesus Christ. And those benefits, I tell you, the forgiveness of sin, joy of the lasting, love eternal, life that never ends, freedom from the judgment of God, all the benefits, I tell you, they're out of this world. They cannot be purchased by money. They cannot be worked for. You cannot get them by being religious. You can only get them by being, being united, engrafted into Jesus Christ by a certain, a true faith. And of course, well, even in your churches today, and not just the city of Nottingham, but throughout the world, and especially so in the Western world today, you find nothing but apostasy. Well, almost. And of course, you've got many people who profess to be Christian. You know, you've got rock and roll churches, and you've got the smells and bells churches. You know, well, you can take your pick. You know, it's just like the supermarket. Just pick some mix and just take, you know, what you fancy. But that's not how God, you see, that's not how God would order things. God has shown us clearly in his word how he is to be worshipped. And what a church is, and what a Christian is. And that's not just somebody who names the name of Jesus, who makes a profession of faith. It has to be a true faith. So the question again is, what is a true faith? What is the faith that is, that unites a person to Jesus Christ and grafts them into Christ and produces for them all the benefits that are to be gotten through the Son of God who came into the world to save sinners. Well, a true faith is not only a certain knowledge, it's that, it's that a certain, a definite knowledge well, of who Jesus Christ is. Do you know that he is the Son of God, Son of Man? Do you know that God, the knowledge of God, uh, the knowledge of his Son, Jesus Christ, this, the Bible says, is eternal life. Knowing God, knowing him whom he sent, Jesus Christ, this is eternal life. But knowing God experimentally, experientially, knowing him by experience, not just reading about him. Some people might say, well, you know, they know the Prime Minister. They know Mrs. May. Not, I guess, many people would want to, but some people might say that, you know. But what they mean is, what they mean is, they know about her. They know about her. They don't really know her. They never met her, you know. They've never conversed with her, you know. They've never had a meal with her. You know what I mean? They don't really know her. They know about her. Well, knowing God, you see, is the same. You might know about God. You might have heard something about God. You might have read something about God. And it might not have even have been true. You know, if it wasn't from the Bible, it probably wasn't. But you see, here's the thing, friends. You know, knowing God experientially, actually having met him, actually having a dealings with him, spoken with him, communed with him, heard his voice speak to you. 
And of course, well, had a meal with him, you know, at what we call the Lord's Table, Holy Communion. You see, it's knowing God, knowing Him experientially. Do you know God? That's the question. Not have you heard about Him. Not have you made some kind of professional faith, held your hand up, signed a bit of paper, you know. Have you been born again, engrafted into Jesus Christ? Do you have a certain and definite knowledge of God through His Son, Jesus Christ? Because the Bible makes it clear God can only be known. God mediates Himself to us, you see. He can only be known through His Son, Jesus Christ. And the Bible says there's only one mediator between God and man, and that's the man, Christ Jesus. Not the Pope, again, not the Pope, not Muhammad, not Buddha, not Confucius, none of these dudes. Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone is the only mediator between God and men. Only he by his death on the cross, his blood shed for sinners, only he can reconcile you and bring you to God. For one of the reasons, the main reason, why Jesus died on the cross was in fact to bring men and women to God. That is when they believe. But a true faith that is. A true faith. A faith that is given by God. Not worked up by yourself. Not imagined by yourself. You might as well try and pull yourself up by your bootlaces. As try to believe yourself. That's impossible. God must give you the gift of faith. For faith is the gift of God, you see? Lest any man should boast. It's all of God's grace, you see, from beginning to end. So a certain knowledge whereby you hold for truth all that God has revealed to us in His Word. If you have a disagreement with God's Word, are you arguing against what the Bible declares? His revealed Word. Well then, dear friends, you know, You've got a problem. You haven't got that certain knowledge of which the Bible speaks. You see, that assured that true faith, because that's what true faith is, a certain knowledge that brings you to an agreement with God. Can two people, the Bible says, can they walk together unless they agree? Well, how can you walk together with God if you disagree with what he has spoken, what he has revealed? This is not possible. So you see, everything God has revealed in His Word. You might not understand it all. You may have understood some of it incorrectly. But if you have this certain knowledge, you know, this assurance, if you have this true faith, trusting that is in all that God has revealed in His Word, you no longer have any argument. You no longer have any arguments about God creating the world. You see, the universe in six days, literal 24-hour periods. God, by the power of his word, spoke the universe into being. If you have this true faith, you now know that evolution is a load of hogwash. You now know it's false. You now know it's false science. You now know, you now know it's not the truth. And you believe the truth of Genesis chapter 1. Thank you, madam. You believe the truth of Genesis chapter 1. That in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. God made it all. You see, for his glory, his own glory. And then, of course, well, you wouldn't be in disagreement to it. You know, about your state and condition. In sin, you What's know. Name? What? No, 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 you said meet God when you die. Huh? What's his name? What's his name? God. Jesus. Jesus. Well, uh, Jesus. Have a good day. So like I can say, friends, you know, it's just, uh, you know, that's what true faith is. You trust in what God has revealed in his word. God has spoken fully and finally. He has given us the Holy Scriptures, Holy Divine Scriptures, the Word of God. You know, they didn't, they were the ones said, the ones said are, are, are delivered by the will of man, but holy men of God speak as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, you know, 
as the apostle in the New Testament said. And of course, dear friends, you know, if you get an argument with God's word about sin, you know, about your sin, your personal involvement in sin, one of the first things, of course, in the dress is your sin, your involvement in it, what it is. I don't know, idolatry, uh, you know, worshiping other gods, you know, the world, the, the religions of this world, you know, uh, or maybe, uh, you know, deep down personal, adultery, sexual immorality, thieving, stealing, cheating people in the marketplace, you know, swindling people, they shall not steal, killing people by means of abortion, euthanasia, violence, drugs, any, any which way, you know, illegally, illicitly taking the life of another, because life is God's to take, God's to give, and God's to take, not yours. God still advocates, God still advocates the death penalty for murder. Amen. Don't you know? But if you disagree with that, well then, surely you haven't got a true faith. Because Amen. that's where true faith is, you see. Yes. You're not in agreement with everything that God has revealed in his word. Now you might not understand it all. No. But you're not disagreeing with it anymore. No. Amen. You know, there's no, uh, you know, there's no fighting there anymore. There's no, no. arguing anymore. No. You're submitted, you know, in a true faith to what God has revealed in his word. Amen. Those are the ones who are saved by Jesus Christ, who have a true faith, you see. Amen. But also have an assured confidence. Confidence not in themselves any longer. Oh, that's God. No longer self-confident. Now you realize, now you've come to the place, the understanding that you can do nothing. Nothing to add to your salvation. Nothing they can do to save yourself. All your perceived goodness has gone out the window. You see your righteousnesses, as God says, it's filthy rags. Unacceptable to God. You see, friends, now you have this assurance. If this assurance within you, you know that you're, you're right with God on the basis, not of what you've done, no self-confidence, but a confidence in what God has revealed and what His Son, Jesus Christ, has done, has accomplished. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, you see, God accomplished in sending His only begotten Son into the world to die on the cross, he accomplished what the law, what, what being good, you know, trying to be good, what self-effort, what religion could never do for you. Religion is legalism. Man working or seeking, trying to work his way back to God. Now, again, you might as well try and pull yourself up by your mood laces. So now your confidence is supremely and totally in one and one alone. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who perfectly accomplished everything given him to do of his Father, coming, living a spotless, blameless life, dying on that cross, suffering at the hands of wicked and cruel men, and all according to the predetermined counsel of God, God's will in sending His Son in His mercy, goodness, and kindness for sinners such as you and I, that you might rest, that you might rest in Jesus, in the person of God's Son, in His supreme ability to perform and to fulfill, to accomplish everything God, his Father, gave him to do, to save, to save God's people. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. Why? Because it's a name suitable. It's a name that describes him. He has the ability, the supreme ability, to save his people from their sin. And now, 
Because you have a true faith, your rest, your rest is in Him. Your trust is in Him. He is able, He is able to keep that which I have committed unto Him against that day. Jesus, Jesus has done it all and He will bring it to a conclusion. A good conclusion, that is. So you see, a true faith rests not in self, not in religion, but rests in Jesus, the person of the Son of God, and His work, what He did. This is the work of God, He says, that you believe, that you trust in the one whom He has sent. Even Jesus Christ sent into the world to be the Savior, the only Savior, the only way back to God from the dark path of sin. Jesus, the Son of God, and God the Son. So an assured confidence, you see, in Him, which of course God's Spirit works in those by the Gospel when it's believed upon. When a person truly believes, you see, God's Holy Spirit works this assurance in people, in the hearts of men and women, giving them the assurance that their sin is gone, their sin is forgiven. And I tell you the joy, oh, you look for joy. I tell you, you shop till you drop, but you still never find happiness. You go to the pub, you go to the football, you do all kinds of things, some legitimate, some not, looking lies. for happiness, but you never find it. Joy, joy, friend, a joy. A joy that's everlasting, a joy that no man can take away from you. Jesus says, I give to those who believe, who trust and rest in Him, sin forgiven. Jesus sent out His disciples one day to work all kinds of miracles, and they came back rejoicing in that they were able to do these things, casting out demons healing the sick, giving eyesight to the blind. Rejoice, he said, not in that you're able to do these things. Rejoice, he says, that your name is written in heaven, that your sins are forgiven. That's where joy, true, lasting joy comes from. The knowledge that God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. That, dear friend, that's true faith. That's true faith. And that's the faith that saves. Remission of sin. Everlasting righteousness. A righteousness not of yourself, because yours and mine is like filthy rags. Yours and mine is no good. You know, it's like a, God says, like a menstrual cloth. That, that's your good deeds. You know, that's the best of your deeds. And that's the best of people. All you people who say, you know, I'm okay, respectable person, all oh, the times have heard it, you know, but you're not okay, you're not righteous. What Jesus says, Jesus says they're whores and drunkards and drug addicts that will enter the kingdom of God before some of you middle class dudes who think you're okay, huh? That you're the height of respectability and righteousness. No, you're not. Your righteousness is as a stench, a stench, abominable in the sight of God. Yeah? All of you. Yeah, even you lot, poor man of Marks and Spencers, finely dressed, just the same, tatters, rags, Right, that's what your self-righteousness is. You need another righteousness. You need the righteousness of God. You need an everlasting righteousness. You need a righteousness that will get you past death, past the judge. You need a righteousness that will get you past on judgment day. You need the righteousness of God that's revealed in the gospel. Jesus is the righteousness of God. 
that of the unrighteousness of God. Only in him is a man righteous. Only in him is a woman righteous. Otherwise, you're dressed in rags. Ah, you're dressed in rags. You're dressed in filthy, filthy, filthy rags. Yeah, unacceptable to God. Defiled, unclean, that's how you should be walking about the city like the lepers of old, you know. Unclean, unclean, unclean. Because that's what you are before God. Unclean to a man, to a woman. Without the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. The righteousness of God is an everlasting righteousness, dear friend. One that will stand this test of time and eternity. So how does a person, how is a person declared to be righteous? Before God, faith is the answer. Not work, not your works, not your doing, not your charitable deeds, not your religiosity, not your church attendance. None of these things, nothing, nothing you do, nothing you do, push you right with God. Righteousness by faith alone, apart from work, apart from any work. The righteousness of God revealed in the gospel. The good news. Jesus Christ. Christ died for the ungodly. For the unrighteous, you might say. Jesus Christ the Lord. Faith in his name. When a man, a woman, truly believes in Jesus Christ, God the Father dons the judge's cap. The gavel comes down and he makes the declaration, an eternal, everlasting declaration, righteous, righteous, because of Christ, because of Jesus, because of the person of God's Son, and because of what He has accomplished, not you. Because you've got nothing, nothing, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to His cross I cling. You've got nothing to offer to God. All you are is just a lump of walk and breathe and talk and sin. I am sin. That's what you are. Without God, without His righteousness, without His Son, Jesus Christ, the righteousness of God, an everlasting righteousness. Dear friend, true faith, that's what you need. A true faith, one that trusts in God through His Son, Jesus Christ, and what God has accomplished through His Son, Jesus Christ. Salvation, a salvation freely given. Can't be purchased, can't be worked for, can't do nothing for it. It's a free salvation. It's simply received, you have to receive. Not achieve, because you cannot achieve. You must receive the free gift of God. He, Jesus, came to his own, but his own received him not. But to as many as did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the power, the right, the authority to become what they were not, children of God. Oh, friend, receive the gift of God. The gift of God, the wages of sin is death. Always has to be, always will be. Why people die every day. People perish in their sin. Lost because they're sinners in Adam and outside of Christ. Because they have not believed. Because they have not received the free gift of God. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. To our Lord Jesus Christ, whom I declare to you once again, here in Nottingham City Center, freely given by God, is a gift. And merely, merely of the grace of God. God no need to save anyone. God no need to save 
a single person out of the human race. But in his grace he has chosen, he has chosen a number out of the human race for salvation. Those who will hear, those who will believe, those who will turn, those who will repent, those who will receive the free gift of God, the grace of God, the undeserved favor of God, unmerited, not favored, not because of anything in you, not because of anything you do, not because you're a good person, not because you're nice, not because of anything at all, simply and only of the grace of God. Nothing else. Only, only the free grace of God. And only for the sake, only for the sake of, of the merits of Jesus Christ. It's He who merits salvation, not you. You merit damnation, you merit hell. You merit eternal lostness. That's who your merits will take you. Merit. The merits of Jesus Christ. He has merited salvation. What he has done. What he has accomplished. His dying. His rising. Salvation, friend. I tell you in none other name. Under heaven whereby we must be saved. Jesus Christ, what is then necessary for a Christian to believe, to become a Christian? Everything promised in the gospel. What is, what is necessary for a person to be saved, to become a Christian? What is it necessary for a Christian to believe? Next time you meet one, and he or she tells you that their Christians ask them what they believe then. All things necessary for a person to be a Christian, to be saved. All things promised in the gospel. Everything promised by God in his word, in his revealed, holy, his divine word. Please, my friends. These are the things that you must believe if you're to be saved from your sin, if you're to be saved from its consequences, if you're to be saved from the brokenness of your life already, if you're to be saved from the fear, fear outpouring of the wrath of God in that day, when he judges you in righteousness by his son, Jesus Christ. Friends, you need not face such a drastic, tragic end as this. You need not, if you will, but repent and believe the gospel. If you will, but seek the Lord. Seek the Lord while he may be found, call ye upon him while he is near. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness because yours is no good. No good at all. Tatters rag. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the rest shall be added unto you. Seek ye Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord. He will show mercy, abundantly pardoned. There's mercy with God. Kindness, loving kindness, salvation, eternal life, love, happiness, joy, all the benefits of the gospel for those that is engrafted into Christ born again of God's spirit repenting turning from their sin and believing with a true faith believing on the Lord Jesus Christ 
God's command to you today. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the promise is thou shalt be saved. Words of the Savior, repent ye and believe the gospel. For the kingdom of God is at hand. That's why nothing happens. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Repent ye and believe the gospel. For the kingdom of God is at hand. Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. God now commanded all men everywhere to repent and turn, turn, turn to his son sent from heaven, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, and able to save to the uttermost all those who come to God through him. Jesus, the Son of God, the second, the last Adam, the one through whom you must be saved. But in answer to the first question, the initial question, no, not all men, all men sinners in Adam, but not all men saved in Christ. Only those chosen of the Father, only those chosen to faith, only those who repent and believe the gospel, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ with a true and saving faith. That might be you, I don't know. I offer you once again a copy of God's Word, New Testament, in its entirety offered to you freely. You're simply for the taking. The Word of God, the testimony, the record of God. Study it, meditate upon it, contemplate the Word of God. See what great things God has done and spoken that you might have eternal and everlasting life. You'd like to have a copy of God's Word? Feel free to come and ask for one. Gladly, gladly place into your hand. May God bless you and have mercy upon your precious, precious, never dying soul.